Welcome to the Building Bridges for Adults workshop on Quakers. George Fox was a young preacher in England in the mid-1600s at the dawning of the Age of Enlightenment. Fox was disgusted by political maneuverings and coldness among church members and by empty pleasure-seeking in the wider populace. He saw that both in and outside the church, people were not living the teachings of Jesus. He longed for a life of greater integrity. Fox believed he knew what could be done. Like Martin Luther, a little over a hundred years before him, he decided to share his insights and reform the church he valued. Fox had no wish to break away and start a new sect. However, his efforts at reform were firmly rejected. In 1647, he began widely teaching a way he fervently believed was better, and within a few years created the Religious Society of Friends. The name Friends derives from the Bible passage in which Jesus says, You are my friends if you do what I command you. John 15, 14. In the beginning, the Society of Friends differed radically from the Church of England, the state religion in England at the time. His reform ideas included simplicity, the Friends emphasized living with simplicity. Later, they would adopt what they termed plain dress and plain speech. Radical equality. Since God loves everyone the same, people should too. Gender, race, wealth, education, community standing make no difference. Value religious diversity and freedom. This concept was revolutionary in that time and place. Friends thought religious monopoly weakened faith and created unspiritual attitudes. Personal revelation. This was another radical idea at the time. Everyone has access to the truth if they are open to listen for it. This is best done by creating stillness and waiting for clarity and messages from the Holy Spirit. No literally sacred text. While Christian in its orientation and using the Bible as its primary textual source, even in the beginning, Friends recognized that since the Bible was written by humans, it should not be interpreted as the literal word of God. Other religious texts are acceptable as inspiration. Consistency and commitment. From the beginning, Quakers quietly, courageously tried to live their values, even in the face of violent persecution. He began teaching. He was arrested for heresy, hauled before a judge, and questioned for hours. During the interrogation, Fox told those present they should tremble before the word of the Lord, after which the magistrate sarcastically called him a Quaker. The term was laughingly adopted as an insult, but the friends felt the description was honorable, and it became a common name for friends even among themselves. The Quakers were evangelists in their early years, preaching simplicity, truthful, peaceful living, and the value of inner experience. They proselytized and won thousands of followers, even though at the time it was illegal to practice any religion but the religion dictated by the king. Quakers also refused to swear oaths or to show respect by taking off their hats and continued to hold banned religious meetings publicly. Like other gentle radicals before them, including Jesus, the Quakers drew the attention of authorities and were targeted for persecution. More than 6,000 friends were imprisoned between 1662 and 1670 alone. This made the New World seem attractive, and Quakers were among the earliest settlers to the American colonies. However, freedom was not guaranteed there either. Many Quakers in the American colonies were jailed and some executed for refusing to serve in the military. Because of their differences in lifestyle and their tendency to live on the outskirts of communities, Friends were even occasionally charged with witchcraft. One difference was not calling their religious gatherings services. They called them meetings, and mostly they sat in silence together, each seeking to create a stillness within themselves to allow the sacred to be heard. No one spoke unless moved to. Even a business meeting was considered worship and was called meeting for worship with a concern for business. Even today, gatherings are called meetings. Quakers were constant to their faith and their influence grew. He was a British aristocrat. He converted to Quakerism and had been jailed many times for illegally promoting the Friends movement. He proposed to the king a solution to the Quaker problem in England. Let them establish a Friends settlement in the New World. This idea was accepted 
and the king named a large tract of land Penn and the other Quakers purchased Pennsylvania. The original Pennsylvania covered present-day Pennsylvania and much of New Jersey. Penn considered Pennsylvania his holy experiment, and while it was predominantly populated by Quakers, religious freedom was the law of the land. Religious minorities soon arrived from all over the world. Penn also created revolutionary egalitarian practices in government, law, education, and healthcare, all of which influenced developments in the United States. The Quaker belief in simplicity in life and the importance of each individual's openness to inner truth was expressed by George Fox. The Lord showed me so that I did see clearly that he did not dwell in these temples which men had commanded and set up, but in people's hearts. His people were his temple and he dwelt in them. One prominent American Quaker was Lucretia Mott. Born in 1793, Lucretia Mott was raised a Quaker in Nantucket, Massachusetts. The faith had made inroads on that island almost a century before when Mary Starbuck, a prominent woman merchant and civic leader, discovered that Quakers espoused the equality of the sexes. Still, even the Quakers had something to learn from Lucretia. When she became a teacher at the Quaker boarding school she attended, she discovered that the girls received less education than boys for the same tuition. She also discovered her salary was half that of her male colleagues. The administration was likely not surprised to hear her views on these matters. She had been known as a spitfire and one whose passions were always focused on issues of justice. Lucretia married at age 18 and moved to Philadelphia, where she set up her own Quaker school. Within a year, the student body increased from four to 40. Bearing six children of her own did not move her from this mission, but losing one of them did. She found herself sharing her grief at her congregation's worship times. In Quaker meetings, parishioners may speak at length on topics of the spirit. The preacher's intelligence and passion had a new outlet in her eloquence. She was encouraged to join the ministry and did at the age of 25. Lucretia became a minister at an exciting time in American religious history. The Great Awakening was underway, putting the Bible at the center of an emotion-driven Christianity. At the same time, William Ellery Channing, one of the founders of Unitarianism, was leading Christianity in another direction. In 1818, he delivered his landmark sermon, Unitarian Christianity, in which he proclaimed that the Bible was but a book and should be interpreted in historical context. This belief resonated with Lucretia's developing conviction that Bible worship was a dangerous thing. Nothing illustrated this idea more potently than slavery and its apologists. Lucretia was incensed to hear preachers justifying slavery on the basis of the Bible and wrote, it is the grossest perversion of the Bible. Yes, slavery was represented in the Hebrew scriptures, yet that did not justify slavery forever and for always. The more she preached against slavery, the more Lucretia felt the rifts in her own Quaker religion. Quakers are and were ardent promoters of justice, but they are also peacemakers. To some of her fellow Quakers, peace meant neutrality, not stirring up trouble. But Lucretia could not remain silent on the most important moral issue of her day. She forged ahead, demanding immediate rather than gradual emancipation of slaves, inspiring and forming alliances with the leading abolitionists of the day, such as Frederick Douglass, William Lloyd Garrison, Francis Ellen Watkins Harper, and Unitarian Lydia Maria Child. Lucretia Mott preached to the inner light of truth and lived by that light. Her husband had a business selling cotton cloth. Cotton was produced by slaves. Thus, his business was indirectly promoting the institution of slavery. At great financial sacrifice, they switched the business over to woolen goods. They had already stopped wearing cotton or using cane sugar. As a woman, Lucretia could not join the American Anti-Slavery Association. Not to be deterred, she and others formed the Philadelphia Female Anti-Slavery Society. Men, even some prominent liberal preachers, howled in protest at this new public role for women. Some men went further than that. When the society gathered at Pennsylvania Hall for its annual meeting, a mob attacked the women on their way in and set fire to the hall. Mott was demonized in the press as well, particularly for walking in public with blacks, inviting black guests to her home and other acts that were against city code. But this brazen infidel who preached at black churches as well had earned a special place in history. Sold woman to speak at the 1840 World Anti-Slavery Convention in London, 
a role she did not particularly relish as the rest of the women were forced to sit behind a curtain, literally out of sight of the male delegates. She, meanwhile, sat on a throne-like chair in the center of the assembly, a lioness, as onlookers described it. Elizabeth Cady Stanton was one of the women who were cordoned off, and she approached Lucretia about helping her address this other great injustice. Their collaboration led to the Women's Rights Convention at Seneca Falls in 1848. Throughout the long campaign for women's rights, Mott found herself preaching against the same religious fundamentalists who thought the Bible justified treating women as property. The first Women's Rights Convention was organized by Lucretia Mott, a Quaker, and Elizabeth Cady Stanton, a Unitarian, in Seneca Falls, New York, in 1848. More than 300 women and men attended, and 100 signed the Seneca Falls Declaration of Sentiments on the Rights of Women. The United States had become a nation only 72 years before. The Quakers are known for their stance on peace. Only three Christian churches are historically considered peace churches. the Mennonites, including the Amish, the Church of the Brethren, and the Religious Society of Friends. A fundamental expression of Quaker faith is the peace testimony. A friends meeting can create a peace testimony for the group, or individuals often write peace testimonies for themselves as statements of faith. Most Quakers remain true to their commitment to peace, despite events like the terrorist attacks of September 11, 2001. This commitment can be perceived by non-Quakers as naive, unrealistic, or unpatriotic. Some Quakers at times have consented to serve in the military for what they believed was a just war. Many friends, however, staunchly believe that violence will never be subdued with more violence. The Society of Friends has gained worldwide respect and recognition for the impact of its faithful work in the world. In fact, the Quakers are the only religious organization to have been awarded a Nobel Peace Prize in 1947 for outstanding humanitarian efforts saving hundreds of thousands of civilian lives in the two world wars. Thank you for listening to the Building Bridges for Adults workshop on Quakers. For more information on this topic, visit our Facebook page.